Hi everyone, in this video we are going to discuss the effects of hydrogen bonding. So up until this point we know what a hydrogen bond is and we know that water is incredibly unique, but we do not know what it is about hydrogen bonding that makes water unique. So in this video we're going to actually try to connect those dots. But in order to do that properly we absolutely need to review what a hydrogen bond is. So a hydrogen bond very simply is a bond between a hydrogen atom on one molecule and a oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine atom on another molecule. And now in previous videos, we've discussed that a hydrogen bond is incredibly strong. It's very, very strong, but we need to keep this in perspective. A hydrogen bond is strong, yes, but it is always, always weaker than an ionic bond and a covalent bond. So let's make sure we keep that straight in our head. And so now the last thing we want to do is show what we actually, or how we actually depict a hydrogen bond. And it is just through those crazy dashed uh, lines right there. So this right there, that's your hydrogen bond. And so we're connecting a hydrogen atom of one molecule to an oxygen atom of another molecule. Whereas these straight lines are always representative of a covalent or an ionic bond. So in this case, it's going to be our covalent bond. So that's how we draw it out. Now what we want to do in this video is talk about what it is specifically about that bond right there, your hydrogen bond, that makes water so unique. So the first thing we want to point out is that water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, which anytime someone says that, you should be like, what? That's crazy. How is that possible? Because realistically, water should boil at something like negative 33 degrees Celsius. So it's ludicrous that it's 100 degrees Celsius. So what you need to be thinking is that in this picture here of our water, we have all these different water molecules and they're connected through a hydrogen bond. And so that hydrogen bond is so strong that it keeps the water molecules in the liquid state instead of allowing them to naturally transition and vaporize into the gaseous state. So what happens is we have to put in an insane amount of energy, which ends up raising the temperature up to 100 degrees Celsius, which is the point at which that hydrogen bond actually breaks. So when that hydrogen bond breaks, all the water molecules become singular. And when it's just a single molecule instead of hydrogen bonding to something else, it can very, very easily transfer from the liquid state to the gaseous state. So I just said a lot, let's summarize. You have to break the hydrogen bond in order to allow the liquid water molecule to convert to the gaseous water molecule. And that's uh, corresponding to a temperature of 100 degrees Celsius. So you need to be thinking hydrogen bonds are really, really strong. They require a lot of energy to break. All right, number two, we also know that ice floats. So in order for that to happen, we know that the density of the ice has to be less than that of the density of the water. So water, liquid water, has to be heavier than that, which is really kind of interesting because we as scientists set the density of water to be one gram per milliliter, which means that the density of ice has to be smaller than that. And it actually is, it's 0 0.92 grams per milliliter. Now, the one thing I want to point out is that sometimes scientists will say milliliter and sometimes they're going to see, say centimeters cubed. You need to be comfortable with both units and you need to be able to transition from one unit to the next unit. We'll practice one at the end of this video. All right, so now why is this though? We can look at this, we could memorize this, but why is this? Why is the density of ice less than that of water because that's completely 100% backwards. Most substances, both most molecules, the density of the solid state is going to be larger than that of the density of the liquid and then the density of the gas. So let's look at a picture. This is a crystal structure of ice, so it's of water in the solid state. So when you look at the structure, all of those red spheres are oxygens and all of those gray spheres are hydrogens. So if we look at this upper left hand corner, what we can see is the oxygen molecule here. And then we see these straight lines that are connecting the oxygen molecule to the hydrogen atoms. Okay. Or excuse me, the oxygen atom to the hydrogen atoms, creating a singular water molecule right here. So now these dashed lines, which are right in this area, are what are representing of the hydrogen bond, whereas the straight lines, so right below it, are representing your covalent bonds. So what you can see is a very, very large structure of several different water molecules all bonded together using hydrogen bonding. 
the unique thing is this is a crystal structure of ice so we're looking at water in the solid state and what we see is that when water freezes it naturally has all these different holes and so you can see these giant holes here in this structure it's anything that's in this like big space right there that's just a hole you go down lower a little bit there's a hole you move over a little bit here's another one you have all these natural holes and so what happens when water freezes and it forms these holes, it actually makes it so that the water molecules in the solid state are further apart. And so they push them apart from each other, thus, thus making it less dense than liquid water. Because as soon as this, these ice cubes melt, okay, so you transition from the solid state to the liquid state, the water molecules are actually able to get closer together. When you're closer together, you are more tightly packed. And if you remember back to the kindergarten definition of solids, liquids, and gases, we we know that our solids usually are the most tightly packed they're the closest together but in this example with hydrogen bonding in water we actually have a structure where our solid states are far, our water molecules are farther apart than they are in the liquid state they're closer together this all has to do with hydrogen bonding so because of hydrogen bonding liquid water is heavier than solid water which is why ice cubes float and which is why icebergs float so think of the titanic right that's why the iceberg floats all right last thing i want to point out here is that water has a ludicrously high specific heat capacity it is 4.184 joules per gram degree celsius so let's break down what that means again i know it's been a while since we talked about it so what that means is that water requires 4.184 joules of energy of energy in order to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Okay, so just let your unit tell you what's happening when you're looking at specific heat capacity. So it takes 4.184 joules of energy in order to raise the temperature of just one gram of water by one degree Celsius. That is such a high amount of energy. That's such a high number. Just to put things into perspective, a lot of liquids with the same molar mass have a specific heat capacity that's less than one. Something like ethanol, which is significantly larger than water, has a heat capacity of close to 2.4 2.5 something like that so water is such a freak it is so weird for something that is only 18 grams per mole to be able to actually require 4.184 joules of energy in order to raise the temperature one degree celsius okay so this should also kind of coordinate or loop back to that first one we talked about where water boils at 100 degrees celsius all right they're all related okay Last thing, let's practice converting that unit from our centimeters cubed to milliliters. You need to be able to go back and forth between the two of them. So octane has a density equal to 703 kilograms per meters cubed. The question is, will octane float on water? And I'm talking about liquid octane here. So when we put liquid octane in the water, is it going to mix or is it going to float? Go. All right, did you get an answer? Hopefully you did, but if you didn't, that's okay. This was definitely a more challenging dimensional analysis problem. So how I personally would have approached this is I would have started off with the only number that we were given, which is 703 kilograms per meter cubed, so per one meter cubed. So the first thing I want to do is translate that or convert that into grams per milliliter or grams per centimeter cubed. And since we're already in meters, centimeter cubed is probably going to be the easier unit. So the first thing I'm going to do is get my kilograms out of kilograms and into grams. So I know for every one kilogram, I have a thousand grams. So now I've taken care of my mass component. Now I need to look at my volume component. So I have meters cubed. So that means I need meters three different times on the top. So one meter, one meter, and one meter. Now we're trying to get to centimeters, so I just need to translate this. For every one meter, I know that we have 100 centimeters. So we just do this three times on the bottom. So now let's check our units. So our kilograms cancels out with kilograms. We're left in grams, that's perfect, that's what we want. Then I have meters cubed here on the bottom. So that really is just a meter times a meter times a meter. So I have three of them. So I have one, two, three meters on the top. I have one, two, three meters on the bottom. So my meters cubed is completely gone. So when I do this properly and I type it into the calculator, 
I end up with an answer that is 0 0.703, and that is in grams per centimeter, and then you have one, two, three, so centimeters cubed, which is an, a unit of density. So now we figured this out, we've translated our number, so we have it in an appropriate unit, so now we just have to compare the two numbers. So we have our density of our octane, which is grams per centimeters cubed, and we know that this is less than the density of liquid water, which is 1.0 grams per centimeter cubed cubed. So now, if it is less, then we know it's going to float. So will octane float on water? Absolutely. It, octane, if you recall, is basically gasoline. Anytime we have an oil spill, right? Remember oil? Remember all this? Anytime we have an oil spill, the oil is definitely on top of the water. We know oil and water do not mix. Definitely octane floats. Have a great week. Take care of yourself. Drink water.